Hello, welcome to Legal Ease. My name is Christopher Lilly. I'm your host. Uh, Legal Ease is a presentation of the Northern Middlesex Bar Association, designed to bring topics of interest uh, to the uh, to the community uh, through through television. I'm I'm joined here today by a state representative and attorney at law, Sheila Harrington. Sheila has a uh, an office in in Groton, uh, and your your area of representation. You told me is. <laughs> Uh, I have the first Middlesex district, okay. which is Groton, Dunstable, Pepperell, Townsend, Ashby, a half of Ayer, and half of Devon. All right. So uh, what we are going to talk about today is the, the Valor Act. Uh, and Valor Act uh, actually takes a number of different, different forms. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, a number of those different forms, but really from the point of view of uh, uh, how it's played out in the cri in the uh, criminal justice system, um, some diversion programs. Uh, Valor sta is, uh, stands for Veterans Access Livelihood Opportunity and Resources Act. And Sheila, you had something to do with the uh, with the passage of the Valor Act or the Valor Acts. Right, right. right. Um, so I w I was actually in office when um, actually the first Valor Act the S Valor Act II, and then the HOME Act, which was the one that was this year. Okay. Um, so they, they're, all, they're all focused on sort of what you said with, with, the, with the acronym Valor, that they're trying to give more benefits and more access and more resources and opportunities to our veterans. So there's a lot of components, and, and we could go into so many of them, but I was... Um, I was on the Veterans Affairs Committee that did the Valor Act II, which was sort of a uh, follow-up cleanup enhancement, so, uh, so to speak, of Valor Act I. Okay. But Valor Act I was really the groundbreaking one, and that's where we adopted the idea of the uh, veterans uh, diversion type programs in the court system. Okay, so let's take it uh, from the point of view of these, uh, and, I, and I think we're going to be focusing on, on two types of diversion. Yeah. We're going to be focusing on the divert the Valor Act as a diversion to uh, lower level uh, criminal matters that a veteran may face, uh, but we're also going to look at it from a, a, a larger point of view of uh, somebody who who may have had some significant trouble with the law, maybe facing jail, and what might be available to that veteran right. to to help him or her out. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start with the diversion of criminal matters. And I equate this a little bit to uh, an episode we had done earlier about restorative justice mm -hmm. and dealing with uh, a situation where a veteran who has no record mm -hmm. finds themselves in trouble for the first time. What's, what's available to them? So, so that's the true Valor Act diversion program. Mm -hmm. And it is, like you said, for someone who hasn't been in trouble in the past, who has a history of military service, that the offense that, that has to make them subject to this program is one that could carry a potential imprisonment, mm -hmm. and they can't have any cases of appeals or warrants or anything else open, as well as a past record. And what that does is, when they come into the court system, someone in the probation department will initially make the assessment as to whether they may be eligible to be part of this Valor Act Veterans Diversion Program. And when that occurs, there is going to be a 14-day stay, so to speak, at which time they're going to have that veteran evaluated okay. and then come back to the court. And if they find that treatment is warranted and that this person could benefit from that and the incident may not have occurred but for the fact they hadn't had the treatment, the court will then continue the case and they'll report back after 90 days. To okay. sh and, and the judge can, at that point, dismiss the case. They can give us uh, another continuance. Mm -hmm. They can handle it however they want. But that program is set up to, to uh, like the restorative justice, possibly give you a clean slate as if it never occurred at all. You you don't even essentially go through the criminal process in that one. They divert you at the outset. They try to get you to treatment. And then hopefully the result is that you are on the right path from the treatment and mm. the charges are essentially gone. Now, it's typically at the arraignment stage where you see this right. come up. Uh, and I understand it's the 
obligation of a probation officer mm -hmm. to, to look into determining whether somebody's a, a veteran, correct? Right. And once, the, once somebody is put into the treatment system, so to speak, there are other resources through the Department of Veterans Services. Okay. There are um, veterans, uh, I'm trying, veterans justice outreach uh, personnel. There are justice and diversion peer services mm -hmm. uh, where somebody who's gone through it themselves can be involved. And these services become available, I believe, in both of the court systems, that they, the Department of Veterans Services can give you sort of a mentor type of person through the program and, and other resources. By both of the court systems, you're referring to the criminal court system as well as the veterans court? That uh, well, the, there, there's the diversion program mm -hmm. and then there's the veteran treatment program. Okay, and we're going to talk that about that in, of, in, yeah. in, in a little bit. Um, but with respect to this court diversion, uh, you had said that a 14 day, there's a 14 day continuance. Right. And what's the, what's the idea behind that? Well, the 14 day period is supposed to give them the opportunity to have the person evaluated. Seems like a short period. It does seem like a short period. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's better though because it makes them do it within the short period. Uh -huh. um, but the idea is to quickly make the assessment whether this person could could benefit from services. I, I think all of this all of the Valor Act. Um, aspects uh, ha have improvement of some recognition mm -hmm. that being a veteran gives you some um, potential issues upon your uh, upon release from service. I don't think it's any secret to you or anybody else that post-traumatic stress disorder has been uh, you know rampant from the gl global war on terror. You also have a higher suicide rate um, than we've had in the past. Uh, so clinical depression, use of substances, illegal substances, alcohol, all of those things that people sometimes lean on to cope have, have made it more difficult for, for veterans when they get back. So okay. the idea is that within that 14-day period, we can say, oh, maybe they acted because of one of those issues now how can we get them to the appropriate treatment so they don't feel as desperate or or dependent or whatever it was that made them do it so an evaluation occurs of that person during that 14-day period or however long mm -hmm. m that may be extended i guess i, I suppose it could yeah, and then so and then what uh what happens after that then the probation will report back to the judge okay. and then it's that it's in the judge's discretion at that point but in the judge's discretion, he can actually choose to have the person go through the program and set a 90-day window before he sees that person, that veteran again. Okay, and that 90-day window, I imagine that the, well, I, I understand that the, that the veteran has to uh, assent to that period, right. waive speedy trial and right. undergo this. What, um, what happens during the 90-day period with the veteran? Well, then I think there's, that's where I think you're going to see some collaboration with the, with the uh, veteran services mm -hmm. agency, with the other um, types of resources that they have available. And a big one, I think, is that justice and diversion peer service where okay. somebody, I, I know that having been on the Veterans um, and Federal Affairs Committee, it, it became very clear to us that veterans generally do better in its therapeutic treatment program when the people with whom they are interacting have gone through a similar uh, um, life experience okay. as a veteran. In fact, we have a program in Massachusetts um, at, I, I can't think of the college that does it in, in Boston, but it's, it's an advanced psychology kind of master's degree. But it, they accept a certain portion of them are veterans just for the pure fact that they are veterans because mm -hmm. that peer sort of um, recognition is they found a, a, a really valuable tool when you're dealing with veterans that are suffering from PTSD and other issues. Okay, all right. So the 90 days have passed. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, as a veteran, somebody has gone through uh, that treatment uh, what are the options at that point for well, the then, judge? Well, then they're going to come back to the court, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a recommendation at that point with regard to 
whether further treatment is necessary, whether things have to be delayed longer, whether the person is complying with the program and, and taking advantage mm -hmm. of the opportunity. And then the judge can say, if the 90 days was sufficient, mm -hmm. the judge can drop the charges. You know, if they see that the person's compliant and they're convinced from the report from the treatment providers that he's on the right path, that can be the end. So the judge has a lot of discretion right. available to him or her as far as mm -hmm. dismissal of the charges or some, right. some other uh, avenue that he or she wishes to take. Right. right. Um, I've seen that there's some dispute amongst judges or how it's, go how it's going to be determined whether a judge can dismiss over a district attorney's objection. I think that's, that depends on the individual judge and uh, right. uh, probably right. remains to be seen how that's going to end up playing out. Well, uh, one of the things I have, I have learned um, in many instances where uh, laws are written sort of mm -hmm. by the legislative branch, they're interpreted differently by different judges sure. when they get out to the, to the floor. So sometimes there has to be a modification if, if the law is being completely ignored in, in some people's perspective, okay. and that really has to be is identified. some of the cleanup term that you were talking about? That might about? be, there yeah. may be a Valor Act 3. I don't know. We may have to do That's another great. one, but, but that, those, are, those kind of responses will get back to them. You know, if there's an over, in fact, um, in some of the aspects of the Valor Act, mm -hmm. things were um, enhanced from what people on active duty were given, so that veterans got them too, or vice okay. versa. Just to, so there's always like a way of wording things that you might miss a, p a piece of it, and so that was part of Valor Act too, was to clean up some of those problems. Okay, let's uh, uh, move into uh, veterans court, mm -hmm. and were veterans courts also called uh, called upon as part of the Valor Act? Y yes, and th those are actually, um, the specific name for them is Veterans Treatment Court. Okay. And Veterans Treatment Courts are uh, another offspring of the Valor Act, and, and these courts in particular deal with people that maybe this isn't their first offense. Okay. Um, in the first one, you, you really have to have a clean history, as we said. In these, you do have to have the history of military service, and this m does not necessarily mean that this is your first offense. I, I kind of equate these to uh, a drug court, which, Very which we've talked about mm -hmm. uh, on previous previous episodes. Right. And I understand it actually arose out of a drug court setting. Yes, yeah, that's what I heard. And, and um, it, we weren't the first to have it. It mm -hmm. started in 2008 in Buffalo, New York, where the first veterans treatment court and diversion court programs came out of uh, New York, I think. But so it's I based on the drug court model? Very much so. Uh -huh. So unlike the other, the diversion court that we talked about, in the treatment court, you actually do plead to sufficient facts or plead guilty, mm -hmm. and then you get in the program. The outcome is really dependent on, on you. So okay. it's usually an 18-month period, I believe, up to an 18-month period that you'll undergo treatment. But your compliance is more, um, more important, even in this case, because the alternative, if you don't keep up with the program, is you could face traditional sentencing. You could go to jail, right? And so it's which is different than the pretrial diversion that we were talking right. about, where it's simply restored back to the calendar. I would right. Imagine. It would be put back on the calendar, and you may or may not, you know. How, however, you could plead not guilty and yeah. see what happens going sure. forward. Yeah. But this is more of um, sort of an admission that you have an issue. Mm -hmm. I think, like the drug court, because I think in a lot of um, serious addiction issues, and, and uh, you know, we're seeing this in the drug court, certainly. Part of getting better is to say that you have a problem. Sure. So if you're not willing to admit to what you've done, you may not ever be able to, to you know, crack it. So sure, to speak. and I, I imagine that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the same issues apply in both right. cases when you're dealing with the drug court or you're tr right. dealing with a veterans court. So we were probably doing that with people that were veterans in the drug court, but mm -hmm. this just makes it more um, more sort of established unto its own, that we're saying we're recognizing that there's a whole set of other issues that veterans are facing. 
and so that there's a specialty court for veterans. Sure. The, the story I heard about how this, how this came about out of uh, Buffalo, New York, I guess, was out of a drug court where uh, a, a veteran was having a hard time uh, dealing with uh, some of the treatment, uh, treatment options. Mm -hmm. And that veteran got together with another veteran who was in, in the drug court. That helping veteran uh, right. helped, helped that person along. And, and really, that, that exposure of veteran to veteran Right. was uh, apparently something that the judge certainly took notice of right. and is what has led to this uh, uh, real focus now on, right. on, on veterans treatment courts. And I think that's why also that um, the veteran service agencies are, are providing that, that other sort of level of people involved in your treatment, the, mm -hmm. the JD, uh, what's the acronym, the, the Justice and Diversion Peer system, I, okay. I, I think, of peer services. Okay. And that is the, the key thing. The peer portion of it is, is different than a, a clinician who's not a veteran. The veteran on veteran right. uh, Makes assistance, I guess, is, mm -hmm. is certainly something that's, uh, it, that's, that's a positive. And, that, that and that's why, I, as I said, there was that program. And it is partially funded by the state to train veterans for to be uh, sort of master's level clinicians, uh -huh. even if they don't really have the academic background to get in, but because they have such a benefit in the problems that we're facing with our veterans coming home, um, you know. And there are there's there are other resources, obviously, too, mm -hmm. that are not related to the courts. Um, and that we've got some really great programs. We have the home base program for the families. That's through the Red Sox. Right, yeah. Red Sox and Mass General. And Mass, yeah, the Mass General, really right. good program. And what, that, what works is that? A, that works a lot with the families uh -huh. as well as the veteran, uh, recognizing the um, PTSD, represent, recognizing that while somebody is serving, that a child especially may need services through the schools, and it is a recognition that it really influences the whole family more dramatically than people are, are tending to, were tending to acknowledge. So. Uh -huh. The Red Sox and Mass General have teamed up on that program, and it really is geared at going after the the non-visible wounds that veterans will have and their families. And their families are also mm -hmm. considered wounded in that sense. And their families are having it when they are away, and then sometimes, you know, there's issues sure. when they return because of the the issues that they're bringing back with them with the uh -huh. PTSD and such. Okay, all right. Good program, though. Sure. So um, uh, why don't we talk about some of the future of, of the Valor Act as you see it uh, right. unfolding now, the Valor Act 2. Well, um, Valor Act 2, like I said, just kind of cleaned up as did the Home Act. Um, the last one, the one that was passed this past July, mm -hmm. that has dealt a lot with issues of discrimination um, of veterans in employment and housing. Mm -hmm. And we've had a, we've actually now made veterans a protected class in Massachusetts. In what sense? So whenever you uh, read those fine print of we don't discriminate based on race, color, creed, national origin, you know, gender identity, any of those things. And in Massachusetts, technically veterans fall within that too. So mm. we found that we protected people in the military sometimes to an mm -hmm. extent better than we, you know, we, we didn't tend to carry that through once they came home. We okay. had limitations on, on um, certain resources as far as tax um, exclusion for our families that had had somebody die as a result of something that had happened in their service mm -hmm. versus actually killed in action in, in, on, while on duty overseas or whatnot. And the reason for that is, again, the recognition is if you have somebody who has served the country, has suffered from extreme mental anguish, mm -hmm. enough so that they t decide to take their own life, well, that that is just as much caused by their service as if they got shot, you know. So we, we are now expanding benefits that we would have given to families where somebody was killed in action. We're now extending it to veterans, families, if they 
dive subsequent to their service from something related to their service. We're, so we're trying to expand that. We're also expanding, um, we expanded in the Valor Act to um, recognition of, of training and education people get while they are in, this, in military service. Okay. So that um, you have a lot of highly qualified people, say in um, mechanical, you know, technical experience that they've done while serving the country. And then they come back, but because they don't have the formal training, they were not able to get those jobs. So we're now saying that we'll expedite them getting their certifications. We will acknowledge certain, um, like you know, in certain licensure processes, we will acknowledge people's service-related education. Or now this experience. is upon somebody's return home, or is this? Yeah. So if somebody returns home and um, is looking for a license in, say, um, I'm going to say something, say, truck truck mm -hmm. operation, okay. Well, rather than them trying to go through a, uh, you know, a, cl a school program to learn how to drive a certain size truck and get their license and go through that process, mm -hmm. they can expedite it by looking at their career in the military. And, and if they were someone who drove a such and such truck, had training through the U.S. military as to how to use it, they'll now recognize that as comparable and they'll expedite okay. them getting their license. and. Um, we, for whatever reason, we discriminate, we disallow discrimination um, against people for um, uh, that in, in uh, work related and job, job um, discrimination. Mm -hmm. If you were discriminated against because you were in active military, okay. but we didn't do it for veterans. Okay. Um, so things like that just didn't make sense. Um, there, there's a number of them. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Is there, there was a financial benefit, especially with the first one too. We were giving more money to veterans coming home, and uh, oddly enough, Massachusetts. You know, I, I always feel like we have so far to go and so much more to do that you, mm. you really can't do enough for our veterans. But we rank first in the state for how how we treat and the programs we have available to our veterans, and I think. The two Valor Acts uh, and the Home Act have taken it even that much further for us. Is there a distinction in, in any of these legislations between um, somebody with military experience or, or having served in the military versus someone who has actually served in a combat situation? Um, n no, not specifically. I think there are, in, in, in there, that might have been one of the things that was addressed, be, and that's okay. when I was talking about if you served, uh, I guess if you were injured in the combat or fatally wounded in the combat mm -hmm. situation, now there's a recognition that if it were just the, you know, anguish of whatever you did that, that caused you to take your own life, that's something that's now been made comparable. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's, I don't know of any specific differences between people who are in combat versus, um, you know, military, Just other military, jobs, yeah. other than through the military themselves, there might sure. be some difference. Okay. But not through the veterans. Service. All right. Some of the other um, uh, programs that I've seen that are available to, to veterans uh, coming through mm -hmm. some of the hard times has been uh, certainly some veterans outreaching to veterans. Right. Um, I think uh, w one thing you were bringing up brought me in mind of uh, comfort dogs. Oh, where, yes, where you've seen those dog being program. service dogs that are being right. uh, trained to to help out in that uh, right in that arena, and, I, and I, that's I, I've heard that that's very very it, it's very great, valuable. It's a great program, yeah. really great program. And um, actually, the Devons Military Museum had a uh, special speaker come in on that that uh, that I was oh, able really? to see, with, and it, they brought the dogs and oh, and, yeah. and and then we had veterans that talked about the difference that it had made in their lives to have these dogs, and I think sort of the old um, sort of theory on the thought or when we thought of them we thought of them for people that were either um, had were vision impaired or hearing impaired or yeah. something like that but actually for people suffering from PTSD they have a huge benefit as well so we are seeing a really effective use of of those dogs outside of just the vision impairment and hearing right. impairment so and and um, you know, it, the anxiety issues can be as debilitating as losing a limb, really. Sure. 
as far as your ability to go places, sure. do things and whatnot. And with these dogs, they seem to be doing a lot better. The wounds that don't show. The wounds that don't show, yeah. that's what it is. But they're just as fatal for, for many of our veterans. Sure. So uh, the veterans' courts, um, we're seeing them in various courts throughout the Commonwealth, but there's still, yeah. it seems that it's not covering right. the entire Commonwealth. There's not enough. To say. Um, so, so the diversion that we talked about in the mm -hmm. beginning is, can be more widespread. The veterans' treatment courts, though, um, we had two established as of um, after the 2012 Valor Act, and then two more, I believe, have been incorporated in this year. But like the drug courts, um, even though it has a huge benefit, it doesn't hit every court in the Commonwealth right off the bat. Um, but that's something I know that they're hoping to grow. Mm. You know, once the su people see success in, you know, one or two of the courts, then you know they're going to sprout up in other courts. This I'd week. like to see it come to air. We've we've got that, right. that military background right, right here in Devons. Air is an, I know air seems like they should have been. The first one, sure. you know, any of the base towns, uh, courthouses should mm -hmm. have probably been considered first. But I think it was more that um, the numbers, probably, I think the Boston Municipal Court maybe was facing huge numbers. And then uh -huh. the other court that initially took it on was Dedham. Dedham. But um, I know that Framingham and Holyoke, I think, have opened mm -hmm. them this year. And I, and know I think the Holyoke Framingham's one probably our area. Framingham by would default, probably be yeah. our area because it's Middlesex. But I know, like Still the quite a hike. I know. <laughs> well, I think Holyoke, though, is actually their service area is Franklin. Oh yeah, Ham County, yeah. Hampshire County, Holyoke. So again, it's still, it's still. We don't have enough people um, and enough resources right now to cover comfortably sure. people in all of those areas. Well, Sheila, I want to thank you for uh, for joining us uh, well, today. Thank this you is, for uh, having me. This has been a, a, a great talk, right. and uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your uh, your coming in. My pleasure. And uh, I want to thank you all for uh, for your attention uh, in, on this uh, this topic. It's a topic that I think is going to undergo some some continued uh, uh, perhaps uh, legislation, but right. uh, uh, certainly some some thought and. Uh, uh, some some services uh, for the b veterans that, uh, that that really need them. Um, as I say at the end of all of these shows, uh, don't take what you hear as as being legal advice uh, uh, that you hear here, but rather go to local council and talk to your local uh, attorney. That's what they're there for, um, and they can help you through with individual uh, with individual issues. Uh, as I said, I'm Christopher Lilly. Uh, I'm here with Sheila Harrington, and I want to say thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Sheila. Thank you.